So I had two sermons prepared for today, of course, as I always do on Sunday. And uh, one is on loving the brethren, and the other one is on God is not mocked. So you're here this morning. Obviously, we read Galatians chapter number six, and if you if you caught it, picked up on that, this is the Bible says that, that whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the Bible warns us that God is not mocked. So we're preaching about God. Not being mocked this morning. It's a little bit of a harder sermon. So if you came here wanting to hear about the love of God, hey, come back tonight. Amen. So, we're, you know, we, we, we try to preach. I try to preach my best to, to preach the whole counsel of God. I want to make sure that we cover everything that needs to be covered in the Bible. But if you're, if you're coming here and you're, maybe you're only hearing like real hard sermons, he's always preaching on sin, he's always, you know, maybe you need to come to all the services because... We're, we're, I'm, I try my best to, you know, and, and I don't know when I preach what, morning, night, doesn't matter. I just, whatever, whatever's coming out. So if you want a little bit of a, of a, I guess, an easier sermon, you come back tonight, you'll hear about the, and you know what? Praise God for the love of God. And, and we're going to do that tonight. It's great. You know, it, it's, it's awesome. But that is tonight's sermon. So come back for that. Galatians chapter six, where we started, the Bible says there in verse number seven, be not deceived. God is not mocked. So God doesn't want us to be fooled or tricked or deceived into thinking that, hey, we could just get away with sin. We could just do whatever we want. And hey, there's no consequence, right? Everything's just fine. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Okay, God doesn't, doesn't allow people just to, to throw around his name and to just be ridiculed and despised and mocked without any consequence. There is a consequence. And yes, there is a consequence even for believers. And who I'm preaching to this morning is a group of believers. That's why we're here. That's why we gather together on a Sunday morning with other like-minded believers to hear the word of God and to learn from it. And one of the things we're going to learn this morning, we know, we know that the unsaved, they have a, a, you know, a punishment coming to them. But that's not... That's not even what this is talking about. This is not talking about salvation in Galatians chapter 6. This is talking about the way things work for the saved as well as the unsaved. This is the way that God deals with things. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. This is a very simple truth. Yeah, when you go and sow anything, I mean, you could sow stuff into the ground, you sow a seed in the ground, it's going to bring forth what, you know, whatever, you, whatever you sowed. It's not going to bring forth anything different than what you sowed. Don't go, you know, sowing grain seeds and expect to get some fruit trees or something growing out of that. That's not going to happen. Right. Whatever it is that you're putting out there is what you're going to receive in return. And he goes on, he uses this illustration of, you know, sowing and reaping because it's something that everybody should understand. It's a very simple concept of planting seeds in the ground. And then, and then whatever you receive, you don't receive just one back of that. So you, you sow one seed in the earth. When that grows and becomes a, a, you know, a fruitful plant, you get produ it produces way more than what was originally put into the ground. Very simple concept, but he applies this spiritually, and he says in verse number 8, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And that, that concept that I was just talking about of receiving way more than what you plant. The Bible says, he that soweth to the wind shall reap the whirlwind. Why? Because it's multiplied. And this is something that we need to be really careful about. Because if we decide, even as believers, to go out and just sow to our flesh and commit things according to our flesh, we're going to receive back way more than what we even sowed. And that is, and, and we have to understand, God's not going to be mocked especially when you have a believer in Jesus Christ, especially when you have someone that claims to love God, to love Jesus, to go out then and sow to the flesh. Well, guess what? God's not going to be mocked by that. And you're going to be bringing upon yourself destruction. You'll be bringing upon yourself, you know, uh, problems to yourself. Now it says here, sowing to the flesh. What does that mean? We'll flip back to Galatians chapter five. We'll get a little bit of an idea of what he's talking about here. Galatians 5, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. They're made known, which, 
which are these? And he, now he's going to list off a bunch of sins, a bunch of things that are considered works of the flesh. So when you're sowing to your flesh, it, you're doing something that's found in this list. And this isn't just all inclusive, but this is to give you a really good idea of what he's talking about. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Just so you know that he's not just saying these are the only things. He says, and such like. And look at what he says next. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I've covered the verses. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of verses that are worded like this. You know, or people who are, who, are, who are staunch believers in work salvation will try to tell you, see, if you do anything in this list, then you're not saved because you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Obviously, we know there's, a, there's another passage that says, you know, and such were some of you in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. So the reason why a person can commit such things and still get to heaven is because, yes, you are, you, you are worthy of hell. You are guilty of sin that, that your, your place that you deserve is hell. But because Jesus Christ's blood washes us from those things, he, he makes us so that we're not these things anymore. And, that, and that's good news. Now, um, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. I want to focus more just on these sins because when you look at these sins, can a person who believes in Jesus Christ commit these sins? Of course they can. Absolutely. See, when you get saved, you get, the, you get the new man, the new creature, the new spirit that's born again inside of you, but the flesh hasn't changed yet. And our flesh is going to drive us to sin. So that's why, that's why you don't see perfect people just walking around on this earth today. I, I haven't seen one. You see, you see one, let me know. I'd, 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 like, to, I'd like to talk to him. Because then, then that would mean that Jesus came back and said, for some reason I didn't know about it. Because... <laughs> If you, there's no way you're going to find a perfect person. I'm sorry. You know, this, the, the, the holiness movement, these people who believe in sinless perfection, they're a bunch of fools and they're a bunch of sinners and they're proud and arrogant and they know nothing because if they actually think that they could be living and not committing sin, then they must have either a really, really, really low standard of what sin even is to think that you could walk in such a way where you just are without sin or they're just so puffed up and full of themselves that they, they're thinking that they're like God. Because there's no way that a humble man can read this book and think that they're walking without sin. There's no way. We sin probably every single day. And you realize that the more you look at this. But one of the things I want to point out here, though, too, is that when we look at this list of sins here in Galatians chapter 5, talking about the, the, the works of the flesh that are manifest, these are pretty serious sins. He doesn't list off every sin you could possibly do, but there's a lot of things mentioned here that you can keep yourself clean from and should keep yourself clean from. And these are the types of things, you know, we know that we're all sinners, and it's, and it's not a, a cop-out. We're not trying to make light of any sin. So, so please try not to misunderstand what I'm trying to express here. Because we should be perfect. We should live holy. That's what, I mean, that's God's standard. That's what he wants from us. But it's also foolishness to think that there aren't degrees of severity of sin. You can get that very clear when you look at God's law and you can see the different punishments that are, that are meted out for different transgressions, for different sins, for different offenses. There is a different punishment because not all sin is equal. We don't believe that here. All sin can carry a punishment of hell, but not all sin is equal. Jesus Christ himself said, you know, that, that he that hath, uh, hath um, yeah, he hath, hath um, what is he, he's talking about Judas, he hath, hath, hath delivered me unto you, hath the, the greater damnation. There's greater sin, there's greater damnation. People commit a greater sin, there, there, there's things that are worse than others. 
I mean, it, it may, it's common sense. If I, if I were to go to work and steal somebody's lunch and out of the refrigerator, okay, that's wrong. That's a sin. That's stealing, right? God doesn't want me doing that. But there's a, there's, a, there's a big difference between taking somebody's apple out of the refrigerator and coming in with my shotgun and shooting everyone in the office, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say there's a slight difference there in, in murdering people's lives and, and, you know, eating somebody's apple? <laughs> of course there is. And we get that. that. That makes sense. So when we look at these sins, you know, there's certain sins, and the Bible points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as well, there's a list of sins where the Bible says, hey, you know what? When you have someone who's a brother in Christ that's guilty of these things, don't fellowship with them. Don't even go out to eat with them. Why? Because they're really bad sins. Because that's something, hey, God understands that we're not perfect, but he's saying, you know what? There is a line that ought not to be crossed and especially among God's people. And if you got someone that claims to be a brother, someone that's known to be a brother in Christ, and they're going off and getting drunk, and they're full of covetousness, and they're a railer, and they're an idolater, or any of these other things, he says, you know what? Don't even go to eat with that person. And it lists here adultery, fornication, uncleanness, you know, all these various things. Strife, seditions, heresies, envyings. Envyings is covetousness. And when you start comparing these verses, like in 1 Corinthians 5, you're going to see a lot of overlap because it's a big deal. And we need to remember that, especially if you're going to get caught up in something like this, God's not going to be mocked. God doesn't just look the other way. God doesn't just forget about it. And the worst mistake you can say is, oh, well, I'm saved, so it's okay then, right? And this is the problem that people have with, with once saved, always saved, which is what we believe here, that once you're saved, you are saved forever. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 3, because even back in Jesus' day, people were saying the same arguments. They had the same problem with this doctrine, with the truth that, that many people have today. Because when we go out and we try to talk to people, we're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we explain, hey, Christ paid for all of your sins, and once you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, you are saved, he saves you eternally, he gives you eternal life, and that that lasts forever, and God doesn't take that away from you because you are saved. Amen. And we tell people that, and, and you know, sometimes people, they really get their, their, their head going, they're involved in a conversation, and they'll, they'll come to a conclusion and say, well, then that means that you can just, so you, what you're telling me is then that, that I could just go off and sin and do everything and then everything's okay? How many people have heard, have heard someone say that before? Of course. Yeah, we, we hear people say that. And what I'm always very careful to do, and you ought to be too, is to explain to them and say, hold on a second. I'm not saying that everything's okay. Because there's a big difference. Now, if you go off and commit sin, are you still saved? Yes, I am saying that. If you, if you receive Christ as your Savior, and then you go off and you, and you commit some sins, are you still going to heaven? Yes, I am saying that. But does that just mean that everything's okay? That God's okay with that? No, of course not. Of course not. Because God's not mocked. And if we go off and, and commit sin, guess what? He's going to deal with us you don't just get off free. He's removed the punishment of hell, yes. But he hasn't removed all punishment and all consequence for your sins. There's, well, we're going to get to that. <laughs> so look at Romans chapter 3 because this is what people were claiming about what the disciples were preaching. Verse number five, where we're going to start reading. Go, go out home later and read the whole passage. You get the whole thing in context. It's a great passage, Romans chapter three. We're going to start reading here in verse number five. The Bible says, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. So what he's saying is, if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God. So it's, it's exalting God's righteousness. It's commending God's righteousness by, by, because his grace 
encompasses all of our sin. So the more sin there is, you know, you know, the, the grace abounds, right? The, 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 where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. You'll see that in Romans chapter 5. And then in Romans 6, he says, well, what shall we say? Then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, hey, should we just keep sinning so that we could just have God's grace can just be greater and greater and greater? He says, no, God forbid. <laughs> That's not the point. And, and it's a very similar point being made here earlier in, in Romans 3, where he's saying, look, if, if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous then who taketh vengeance? He's saying, well, wait a minute. God, how could God take vengeance if his grace is just, you know, covering all this sin? Verse number six says, God forbid. Again, that same language. Well, God forbid. No, of course, that's not what we're teaching here or saying. For then how shall God judge the world? Yes, there is grace out there, but God is still a judge and a righteous judge. Look at verse number seven. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judge a sinner? Saying, well, wait a minute, you know, if I lie, but then God, you know, it's abounded through my lie unto his glory, why am I also judge a sinner? Look at verse number eight. And not rather as we slan be slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say. So people were saying this about them and it was a slander to them. It was not what they were saying. But some people said, let us do evil that good may come. Oh, so you're saying that we could just go off and sin and then it's, we're, we're okay, everything's good? Good's going to come? We're going to go to hell? Everything's great? And this is what people, and it says here, whose damnation is just. Right? That's, that's not what God is teaching. That's not what God's saying. Now, of course, we have eternal life, but God is not mocked. And we need to understand that as children of God, God will come down and discipline us and make things miserable for us. And you know what? Maybe even take our life away from us on this earth and lose all opportunity to serve him and do good for him and to, to get any rewards in heaven and things like that. There's a lot of things that, that are consequences. And you know what? You cause consequences not just on yourself, but on other people, on people that you love. You cause bad things to happen through collateral damage of your sin. That happens. Look at, read, read the Old Testament. Read about King David. Read about the sins he committed and look at how his sin impacted so many other people because God's judgment had to come down on him. Was he a believer? You better believe he was. Was he born again? Yes, he was saved. He was a saved man of God. And it wasn't by his own works and it wasn't by his obedience to God's law. Because that old covenant couldn't save anybody. Because no one was able to keep it. And it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats either that was able to wash away his sins. It was his faith. He had eternal life. Read Romans chapter 4 to get the, the full understanding on that. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 8. But see, our sins, and especially these really wicked sins... They're going to cause a lot of problems for you because God is not mocked. And we can't just throw things to the side and say, well, at least I'm, well, I'm saved. And I heard this recently from someone who's just a story that I heard about someone committing, you know, really wicked sins. Really wicked sins. And what I heard was that their attitude was just like, well, I'm a sinner. And this is from a saved person. Well I'm, uh, well, I'm saved, but I'm a sinner. And just being real flippant and just whatever about their extreme wicked behavior. And apparently extreme ignorance. Because if you just have that type of an attitude, that attitude alone is wicked thinking that you can just, well, I'm just going to do, oh, I'm, I'm a sinner. Okay, well, what am I going to do? You know, I'm, no. No, you're, you're, you're despising what Jesus Christ even did for you. Now, that, again, that doesn't make you unsaved, but I don't want to be around that person anytime soon, not, not until after they repent. And even then, you know, I mean, they're, that, that type of an attitude and, you know, they've already experienced a lot, and, and I've seen that. And that's, I'm going to leave it at that because there's, I'm not going to be calling people out personally or whatever, but um, it doesn't matter. It's, it's uh, for you, but we need, to, we need to take heed to this because this is taught very clearly in the Bible. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 1. The Bible says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. This is talking about, this is God talking to the children of Israel, his people, right? His chosen people that he gave the law to, saying, look, everything I'm commanding you to do, you need to do these things. Why? That you may live. It's, gonna, it's good for you. I want you to live. I want you to multiply. I want you to be blessed. So you need to do, listen to my commandments. Verse number two. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou, fought, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And again, this is quoted, Jesus quotes this in the New Testament, just reiterating how important it is. We need every word of God. We can't just be flipping about God's word, about God's laws. He's saying, you know, I want you to, to listen to this and obey. Look at verse number four. We'll keep reading here. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man ch chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. This is the understanding that we need to have. Just as much as me as a father, I am not going to put any of my children in my oven and turn it on broil and leave them in there forever. It's not going to happen because I love them. However, because I love my children, you better believe they're going to be chastened. They're going to be disciplined. They're going to have consequences for their actions because you know what? I'm not going to be mocked of my children. I'm not going to allow them to just do whatever they want, just be in rebellion. No, they are not, they're not going to mock me. They're going to be punished. They're going to be disciplined. And you know what? The worst things that they do, the worst their punishment's going to be. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8 here, you know, basically Moses is explaining to the children of Israel, hey, God's going to deal with you as children. And he lists off, he took care of you. He made sure you were fed. He made sure your shoes didn't wax old. You had clothing. He took care of you. But guess what? He's not going to be mocked. Guess what? When you, when you start to become rebellious and you don't listen to him, he's going to punish you. He's going to discipline you. So no, when we say this, everything isn't just okay. Just because you're saved from eternity of hell doesn't mean that everything's just all going to be okay. You want to be living under God's blessing and not being disciplined all the time. Who wants to be punished all the time? I know I don't. I don't want to be punished at all. And that should be a good deterrent to, to keeping us on the right track here. Therefore, then verse number six there, he says, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. I preached not too long on the fear of the Lord. This is something that, that we need to have more of. We need to make sure that, that we have a proper fear of God. And fear doesn't just mean respect. We definitely ought to respect God, but we ought to have a proper fear too. We'll get to that in a little bit. Look at, flip over to chapter 21 now, Deuteronomy. As long as we're in Deuteronomy 8, just flip forward to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Because we need to take serious warning about how God feels about rebellious, disobedient children. Because that's what you are today. You're a child of God. If you're born again, you are a child of God. Praise God for that. But we'll see how God dealt with rebellion in the Old Testament. And again, this is, this is a physical law for physical children in a family, but the teaching is still there that could be applied spiritually. In God's law, and, and you know what's funny? I love preaching on this stuff. I, I do, because the atheists and the people who want to mock God always want to throw these types of laws at you as if it's just some ridiculous thing. But you know what? I glory in God's word. I think it's great. Amen. Just because the world might think a law like this is crazy or what, you know, whatever they think, or they want to deride you because you believe the Bible and the Bible says something like this, 
I say, well, shame on you. You're a fool. You don't know what righteousness is. You don't know what proper judgment is because God knows way better than you do. And just because you've been brainwashed and conditioned in today's society to think that, oh, no, we could never do anything like this or enforce any rule like this. Look, I'm going to trust God's form of judgment and punishment more than yours. Because God's right and you're wrong. And that's the bottom line. And I'm not going to let anyone push me around and bring up, oh, well, don't you know the Bible says here? They, you know, if, and and they, all, they always quote this wrong. They always, always, always say, oh, well, if you have a, if you have a disobedient child, then you're just going to put them to death. And, and they're referring to like a five-year-old or so, you know, as if like, you know, all kids need to be corrected in punishment. That's not what this is talking about. And we'll see this in just a minute here. But we're gonna, what we're going to see here in God's law in Deuteronomy 21 is the death penalty for a son that is a rebellious, stubborn, disobedient child. But it's not just your average child. This, is, this goes, and we're going to see what he's talking about when it brings up being a glutton and a drunkard. You know, obviously he's not talking about a five-year-old or a six-year-old or a seven-year-old, right? It's not talking about some little child. It's their son, but it's not some little kid, you know, that's, that's whatever. Let's read it, though. Let's, let's see what God's word actually says. Verse number 18, Deuteronomy 21. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. And notice, this, it's also put in there that they're disciplining him. These aren't parents who just let their kids go off and do whatever and there's no consequences. No, this is, this is a son that they're not listening to their father, they're not listening to their mother, they're getting disciplined, they're being chastened, and it, they just don't want to listen. And they just, just completely refuse. They have no respect. They have no fear. They don't care at all. They could receive however many chastenings, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't influence them at all. Verse number 19 says, Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him out unto the elders of his city, and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. This is God's holy word. I don't know about you, but, but I think that's righteous. I think that's right. I think that's a proper punishment. And I think that, that th this is right. This is true. And if someone wants to throw this in my face, I'll say, you know what? Yeah, I do believe that. I probably don't believe whatever you think this means of, of saying, you know, like, oh, yeah, so you're going to, are you going to put your kid, you know, because my, my oldest child is eight years old. It's, oh, you're, you, has your child ever been stubborn or rebellious? Yeah, they have been. But they're not, they, 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 first of all, they respond to the chastening, first of all. Second of all, they're not gluttons or drunkards. My eight-year-old's not just getting drunk every day and, you know, cursing me and my, you know, like, of course not. That's, that's not what this is talking about at all. People have a, have a tendency to, to lose just all common sense when, they're, when they want to just trash God's word. But let's, uh, let's turn, if you would, to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3. The reason why I turned to Deuteronomy 21 is to show you, hey, if that's God's law for like just a family here when, when they have a child that's completely rebellious, disobedient, it's still their son, right? I bet you the mother and father still love them because they're their child, they're their son. But enough is enough. They can't be mocked. And we show God puts a, a very high value on respect, especially respect within the family, respect to his name, you know, respecting your mother. The Bible says to honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the earth, right? That's a, the, 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 the law that, that has a promise there. It's actually going to be benefit. It's going to be a good thing for you. You're going to be blessed when you honor your parents, so you respect your parents, you take care of your parents. That's the way that God designed it, and he does not tolerate the contrary, of just total rebellion, disobedience. He says, no. That, that, 
is bad enough to have loss of life. But he deals with us as with children. The Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. It's good to discipline our children, to chasten them. If you love them, you will. The Bible says, actually, if you don't do it, then you don't love him. The Bible says that you hate him. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. You say, well, I don't hate my son. Well, if you're not disciplining him, then you do hate him according to the Bible. And again, I'm going to defer to God's word over your understanding or interpretation or whatever you say. I'm just going to go with what the scripture says. And if it says that you're sparing your rod, it says you hate your son. I believe that. But he that loveth him chasteneth him times. Proverbs chapter 3, right? You turn, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. So don't hate it. We all need to be corrected from time to time as God's children. Don't hate when you do get corrected. The Bible says, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. We just need to remember when, you know, and you ought to know. You ought to know. I know when I'm being corrected by God for some sin or whatever I do, I know it. If you don't know it, you're just deceiving your own self. You ought to be an analyzing your, your, yourself on a regular basis. Because you want to keep yourself humble and you want to keep yourself right with God. You ought to be thinking about this, you know, and not all bad things, and I've preached this many times before, not all bad things that happen is a punishment from God. Bad things happen in life as a result sometimes of other people, of other people's sins or other, you know, other people doing wrong to you, whatever, okay? There's, other th there's reasons why bad things can happen. It's not always a punishment from God, but the first thing that we ought to do is check ourselves. You know, something bad happens, be like, hey, am I, am I being punished? What did I do wrong? Don't, just, don't be the first one to think that, oh, someone else is doing something. You know, it's all their fault, them, 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 them. We should be, we should be looking at ourselves first. Now, if you can honestly say, well, yeah, I, you know, I don't know why this happened, like Job, right? Job did not get some punishment from God because he was in some wicked sin or wicked. No, he didn't have that. He was, he was living a righteous life. The Bible says that there was not, you know, that he was the most, God himself said that there was, you know, Job was the most righteous man living upon the earth at that time. So everything that he went through, was it because of his own sin and God's, you no, know, it wasn't because of that. But see, Job was able to analyze himself, but he realized, hey, this isn't, you know, it's not for me. This is, I didn't just bring this on myself. And he was right in his assessment, but he didn't understand why it was all happening, right? But who was attacking him? Satan. Satan was the one casting him down. Satan was the one that was accusing him and, and being the false accuser. So, yeah, I mean, when you go through problems in your life, it's not always because of you, but you should always be humble enough to look at yourself first. Verse number, uh, turn if you go to chapter 19 there in Proverbs. We're going to look at a couple more verses in Proverbs. Because what we don't want to do is get to a point with God where there's no more hope for you. And again, this is not talking about our salvation. I mean, once you're saved, you're always saved. But just as, as that son that we read about in Deuteronomy 21, where, hey, I mean, he's our son. Nothing's going to change the fact that he's their son. But we're chastening him. We're trying to discipline him. We're trying to talk to him. We're doing everything we can. And he's just not listening. He's stubborn. So what happens? At some point, you just have to say, well, he deserves a death penalty. That's it. There's no more hope of fixing the problem. And we don't want to let our hearts get so cold that... No matter how much discipline or correction that God tries to bring into your life and you're being chastened, that you still just have this stiff neck and cold heart and unreceptive to, to, to turning back to God, to repenting, that he just says enough is enough. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Proverbs 29, verse 1 says, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. It means there's no fix for that. There's no remedy for that. There's no, there's no fixing it. That if you're being often reproved, 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 you're wrong, you're wrong, chasing, 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 and you just harden your neck, nope, not me, I'm not doing anything wrong. 
The Bible says suddenly you're going to be destroyed, and that without remedy. God can easily end your life. And again, we need to keep this in mind. Acts chapter 5 is an example of this. Turn it, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm not going to read all the scripture on this. You could read it later if you want the story. If you don't already know the story of Ananias and Sapphira, in Acts chapter 5, they sold a property. And in, this is the beginning of the book of Acts. There's a lot of excitement going on. There's a lot of people getting saved. Hey, there's, you know, the church is exploding and people are coming in and they're laying down these offerings and saying, hey, we want the work of God to be good. You know, we want people going out and preaching the gospel. So we're bringing in all this money and stuff to say, hey, let's distribute as we have need. People are coming in. They're making great offerings. And, and just the word of God is exploding. Okay. And one of the things that happens is Ananias and Sapphira, they had some land, they had some property, and they sold it. And they're like, hey, we're going to give this money to the church. We're going we're gonna to give this money here because we want to be a part of this. We want to help get the word out. But what they did was they lied about it. They lied. Now, here's a great example of what many people might think that's not that big of a deal. But God thought it was because they fell down dead. And here's what they did. What they did was they sold a property and they gave money to the church. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. You give money to church, you know, that's fine. But what they did was they lied about it. They said that basically they gave all the money that received from the property, but they kept back some from themselves. So what they were doing is they were trying to make this big show of, yeah, we sold all property and we gave all the proceeds to the church. This is what we got. And he's, they even told him, like, you're not lying to man. You're lying to the Holy Ghost. Like, like it's, it's a grievous sin. It, it's terrible. What a horrible condition of the heart to just, just, oh, yeah, we gave all this money. It's like, look, they even explain. When, it, when you owned it, it was your own property. You could do with it whatever you wanted to. You could have sold it and given whatever you wanted to give or not given anything. But the fact that you're lying about it and making this big deal about it, you know what? That makes God really angry. You know what? That's mocking God. And I believe, I believe Ananias and Sapphira were, were saved. I believe they were. I believe they were believers. But God took their life from them. A another example that you say, oh, well, I don't think they were believers. Okay, well, how about in 1 Kings? When the man of God came and cursed Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Do so you remember after the kingdom of Israel was, was rent in twain, it was, it was divided up? Jeroboam was the first king of Israel. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was the king of Judah. The king of Israel, Jeroboam, was worried that the people were all going to go back to the house of David, go back to Rehoboam, when they went back to worship God. So, he came up with this idea saying, well, I don't want their hearts going back there, so I'm just going to build up these altars over here. I'm going to erect these idols and make it so that the people don't go back to Judah to worship. They're just going to stay right here, and that way I could stay in power, and I, and, and I could be a king. So he builds this altar, and God sends, there's a man of God, literally, he's called the man of God, goes, and he preaches, and he prophesies, he's saying that, you know, um, you know, this, the altar is going to be rent in twain and it breaks. And he's saying that men's bones are going to be burned on an altar and all this, you know, all this great stuff. And he's preaching against them. He does his job. Amen. The man of God tells, him, tells it the way it is, right? As he's leaving, he's going out of town because God commanded him to preach the message. And then he says, you know what? Don't go back the same way you came. You got to go out a different way and don't stay there. Don't tarry. Don't sit down and eat. Just get out of there. That was his commandment from the Lord. God's clear instructions. And again, people might say, well, what's the big deal if you, you, know, you sat back down and ate? And, and what happened was a man, a, another guy saw him in a way. He's like, oh man, that's great. You know what it is? And he lies to him and he says, hey, come back to my house. And the man guy said, well, yeah, I can't come back to your house. You know, the angel had told me this. He's like, I got to get out of here. And he's like, well, you know what? An angel of the Lord talk, talk, spoke to me and told me to have you come back to my house. But he lied about it, right? So he lies, and the guy's like, all right, yeah, I'll come back to your house. He goes back to the guy's house, and you could say, yeah, but he lied to him. He was deceived, but he had God's clear instructions. Don't trust what other people are saying to you. 
oh, well, God told me this and God told me that. When you already have the clear instructions from God, because if someone's contradicting what God already told you, guess what? That wasn't God speaking. And he should have known better. Being a man of God, being sent to do that. But he didn't. I mean, he, uh, he probably did know better, but he, did, he just did it anyways. He still sinned. He went back to this guy's house. And while he's eating there, the same guy that, uh, that lied to him, then God actually speaks through him. I'll read this passage for you. It's in 1 Kings 13, 21. It says, And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. So now that guy really does have a word from the Lord. He lied before, but now he actually is telling them, this is, what, this is really what God's saying. And as a result, it says, It came to pass after he'd eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. Coincidence? No. Of course not. There was a man that lost his life because of his sin. I think it's pretty fair to say that this, what the Bible refers to as the man of God was saved. Amen. He's a man of God. Of course he's saved. He's saved. He's not a false prophet. He was preaching the truth from God's word, but he, commit, he transgressed God's commandment. And you know what God said? I'm not going to be mocked. God's not mocked. Don't let yourself get the attitude, well, I'm saved, I can just do whatever I want. No. No. I mean, yeah, you're not going to go to hell, but don't make your, your life cut short. Don't allow yourself to get through, just go through life with all the chastenings and beatings, you know, from God because you're not listening to Him. You're going to make your life miserable. And God doesn't want you to be miserable. He wants you to have joy. But the only way you're going to get that is through obedience to his word. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. I think someone was mentioning this earlier on in the sermon. I was, I was getting to this. Hebrews chapter 10. He's got to wait for it. I want you to see how strong this language is. That's why we turn to things like, you know, the son being put to death for, for being a rebellious, stubborn, disobedient child. That's why we're turning to these various places and we're seeing examples of things because we need to have a healthy fear of God. We don't need to get flippant. And in, in, in today's, you know, Christian culture, you see the t-shirts out there that, that just, they really bring down the name of Jesus Christ. You know, we're supposed to be exalting his name. We should be, you know, very humbly, like, like on our knees and, and worshiping the Lord and not be just talking about our Savior Jesus Christ as just like JC or as, as God the Father is the old man upstairs and just using these, this terminology that just completely brings down the name uh, uh, that, that is above all names. You know, Jesus is my homeboy and just talking to it just, just like, like, are you kidding me? That's disrespectful. That's wicked. It really is. But the more we see things like that, the more desensitized you become to that. Even if you don't say things like that, you know, after a while, you might just be getting this mindset of just like, yeah, we're just, you're buds. You know, and, and are there verses in there that, that where Jesus Christ says things like, hey, you're my friends? Yeah, there are. But you, when you read the whole passage, he says, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Then you're my friends. If you're keeping my commandments, then you love me. So there is still this relation. There's a, praise God for the relationship. Praise God that we can read earlier in Hebrews. You're in Hebrews 10 where he says that, that um, you know, he counts us as brethren. Wow, that ought to be humbling enough because when you read how much Jesus Christ is exalted, just the fact that he can say that he counts us as brethren it's great, but don't turn that around on its head and just be like, yeah, he's my bro. He's my, yo, we're going to go out together, go out to the bar. We're going to go do this and do that. You know, it's like, no, no. 
You be humbled by the fact that he's willing to even call you his brother. But it's not, it, it, it doesn't turn into this uh, loose relationship of, of being able to throw his name around as if it, he's, he's not as holy as he actually is. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to start reading in verse number 24. I preach on this many times on the importance of going to church. The Bible says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We ought to be encouraging each other, provoking unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, so there's a connection here between not going to church where you're going to receive the encouragement, where you're going to be edified, where you're going to have people there to help lift you up, encourage you, and to keep you going. When you get out of that, then you're going to find yourself sinning willfully. You're away from the, the encouragement. Before you know it, you get out of church, you start backsliding, and you're going to end up finding yourself sinning willfully. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now, this passage, I believe this is talking to saved people. I don't believe this is talking about the punishment of hell. Just because God has fiery indignation, just because you see that word fiery, doesn't implicate that, oh, well, this must just be talking about hell. No, you can have fire anger without sending someone to the lake of fire. You can be very angry. This does not say that you're going to hell. It says, but hey, there is a certain looking for of judgment and fire indignation. When you're sinning willfully against God, you better be scared and you better be watching out for judgment from God because he is going to chasten you. He's going to try to correct you. Let's keep reading. Verse 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So he's bringing up the law of Moses. And what was the law of Moses? The law of the land. So if you commit something like we saw earlier, one of those things was a son being put to death. Right? So hey, the mouth of two or three witnesses, you're put to death under that law. And now he brings it into the spiritual realm. He says of how much sore punishment, so how much worse is it going to be Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. And look, and this is why I say this is talking about believers. And hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. So was he sanctified by the blood of Christ? Yes. This is talking about a believer. He's sanctified. He's saved. But how is he viewing the blood of Christ? He's counting it as an unholy thing. As if... You know, it doesn't matter. He's, he's treading Christ underfoot. Like, it's bad enough that Jesus had to pay for our sins so he's crucified on the cross, but now you're taking that payment and you're just walking all over him. When you sin willfully, when you just decide to disregard God, disregard his commandments and say, well, I'm just a sinner, so I guess I'm just going to keep on fornicating or I'm going to go on keep on having adulterous affairs or I'm going to go on doing whatever, just being a drunk and doing all sorts of stuff. You're treading underfoot the Son of God. How much sore punishment. You know, these people died in the Old Testament. God's going to be that. I mean, he's so angry. He's going to make it that much worse for you when you just tread underfoot the Son of God. And hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith you sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. When you take God's grace and just say, well, I'm just going to keep on sinning because God's grace is going to cover it. You are actually showing despite to God's grace. You, you, you are, you're despising it and not honoring and glorifying and being thankful for that grace and trying to, you know, because think about it. The more you do, it's like, I know Jesus already died on the cross. But he paid for the sins of everybody. And the more you sin, you, it's like you're piling up all this sin back on top of Jesus Christ. Here, pay for this. Here, pay for this. Here, pay for this. That is not the attitude of someone who loves Jesus. 
You should be so thankful that he saved your soul that you're going to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try to do everything right. I'm going to try to do everything the way that, that you want me to, God. I love you. I thank you. I'm humbled that you even did this for me. And I'm going to do what's right. And this is, this is the exact opposite. This is someone with a bad attitude of if we sin willfully. Just, just knowingly. Look, many of us may sin, you know, without really thinking about it. You do something and you're not just like getting it. You're not just like, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyways. People slip and fall when it's, you know, oh man, I should know better. Or, oh, I didn't even know that. I mean, that was the case with my wife for many things because she wasn't raised up with the Bible at all. So when she got saved, everything was new. She didn't understand the scripture at all. So there's many things that she was just like, I didn't even know that was a sin. I didn't even know that was in the Bible. That's sin sinning ignorantly, okay? But once you've already been told about things and once you know about it and then you decide to do them anyways, now you've crossed the line into sinning willfully. You say, I know it's wrong, but I'm gonna do it anyways. And that's what we're talking about here in Hebrews chapter 10. And that is serious. The Bible continues on here. Look at verse number 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Don't think because you're saved that there's just no judgment now. The judgment of hell is removed, yes, because Christ paid for that. But all judgment isn't removed. God shall judge his people. You are his people. Through Jesus Christ. And then he, in verse number 31, he says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Having that healthy fear is going to keep us right with God. Don't ever forget, God is not mocked. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12, the last place to look at tonight, or this morning. It's not night yet. I haven't been preaching that long. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Verse number five, the Bible says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, the word scourging, it's like a whipping. It's like literally using a whip and whipping you. Now, I don't know anyone that would look forward to something like that or would, would be happy when you're getting whipped. Right? It's not pleasant. But the Bible's teaching us that, hey, if God loves you, you're going to receive that. Because he knows you're going to fail, but he wants to correct you. And we need to remember that. And, you know, unfortunately, some people end up getting disciplined by God, and they let that then just get them out of church completely, and they just go the wrong way. And that is the wrong choice to make. That's dangerous to do that. Don't, don't let that discourage you. We need to be, and this is one of the reasons I'm preaching this this morning, is to bring this up, that hey, maybe you screw up really bad. Maybe you choose to do something willfully and God punishes you. Remember that the reason why you're being punished is because God actually loves you and he cares about you. He wants you to do what's right. That's why I punish my children. Because I know that how much better their life will be when they make the right choices as opposed to the wrong choices. I know how much better. If I never disciplined my kids for stealing or for, do, you know, whatever, for lying, they're going to grow up thinking that that's okay. Do you think they're going to be living a very fulfilling, good life of continuing to steal and lie? And, you know, of course not. That's going to that's going to bring condemnation to their life. It's, it's not, that's not a good life for them to have at all. That's why we discipline them early, get the problem corrected so that they realize, hey, when you actually make the right choices, things are going to go really well for you. And that's going to play through for the rest of their lives. God knows even better than we know. God knows better than I do. With, you know, I'm trying my best to raise my children according to Scripture. But God knows even more. So when he chastens us, he really wants the best for you. He says, no, what? this really isn't good. It's not good for you to be having lustful thoughts towards someone who's not your spouse. 
Because if you keep that up, it's going to lead to action and then it's going to destroy your marriage. It's going to destroy your family. And you're just going to have all kinds of problems from here on out. He says, hey, let's get this fixed right now. You're going to be disciplined and chastened when you start going down that wrong path. Right. And it could be anything. I mean, pick the sin. Pick the sin. Doesn't matter. But remember that when you're chastened by God, when things start going, oh man, why is this happening? And unfortunately, those bad things sometimes cause people to get further into their sin instead of taking a step back and realizing, wait a minute, maybe I should, I should back off of these things I'm doing. You know, the person who starts the social drinking and then something really bad happens, instead of recognizing, hey, maybe God's chastening me because I'm starting to go off here in an area where I shouldn't be getting into, then they use that event and say, oh man, I can't believe this happened. Now I'm going to start drinking even more and making it worse for themselves. Don't be deceived by that. You know, th that's why we always should be looking to ourselves, as I mentioned earlier. First, are bad things happening because of me? Is it, did I do something? And really taking a serious look. And even if it's not because of you, it's still a good attitude to have because, you know what, then you should be really thinking, well, I need to get more right with God. I need to change. I need to, I need to get myself a little bit more walking righteously. It's the best attitude to have. Let's keep reading here in Hebrews 12. We're almost done. Verse number seven, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, or of all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You say, you know what, the time that you should be worrying is if God's not punishing you. If you're willfully sinning, getting involved in stuff, I'd be questioning your salvation. <laughs> because that's how the, the, the unsaved, that's how the bastards are dealt with. Because you know what? They're going to have their punishment one day anyways. So it's all going to come back. But if you're, if you're a son of God and God's going to love you, he will discipline you. So when you're just get, seemingly getting away with everything, I'd be really, I'd be really scared at that point saying, am I even saved? Not because salvation's hard, but because does God not love me if I'm not going to be disciplined for my sin? Verse number nine, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and, gave, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Go in the right way. Don't go continue in the wrong ways. And you know what? Help the... the Lift up the hands that hang down. Get strength and be encouraged. Encourage other people and help us. And again, back to Hebrews 10. Get back into, you know, get into church. We need it so much the more as we see the day approaching. Get the encouragement, the edification, and the things that we need to keep going forward so that we don't just allow ourselves to get down, caught up in this downward spiral of sin and, and, and getting away from God. Revelation 3.19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. When the chastening comes, let's repent. Let's get right with God. Let's, let's, let's change. Get rid of the sin. But um, the, you know, the, the point of this sermon is, is to make sure that we remember. And we remember very carefully that, that God's not mocked. That yes, you're saved by grace through faith. There's no works. No obedience to God's law is going to save your soul from hell. And that's not what God uses to determine who goes to heaven or hell. It's just your faith. But also remember that God is not mocked. And that whatsoever you sow, good or bad, that's where you're going to reap. It's coming back to you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for these great truths in the, in the Bible and for your clear instruction on this. Dear Lord, I pray that you would please help us to receive that instruction. Lord, help us to, to overcome our flesh and the, the fleshly desires that we have, that we could be walking in our spirit and strengthening our spirit, dear Lord, so that we, we don't fulfill the, the lusts of the flesh and that you would um, help us have the victory, especially so we wouldn't get to a point to where we just willfully sin against you and just make all these excuses and justifications for our sin, but rather, Lord, that we would have a fearful attitude of, 
of your judgment and, and being concerned that, hey, if we, if we are transgressing against your commandments, especially some of the greater sins that were mentioned, Lord, that we know that, that you're not going to be mocked and you're going to come down on us. Help us all to, to not have to learn the hard way, but that we could just learn from your words as, as we look at them this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.